At any rate, um, <clears throat> I'm going to be doing a presentation on the magic of acrylic. So, what I'm going to do is bring you through the process as far as incorporating acrylic into our work. I work with my son, Jesse, <clears throat> who's 38 years old, and I've been doing this since 1977. I'm going to give you a little bit of a history of ourselves and the work that we do. I'll try to have a process as far as bringing you through the anatomical aspect of it in relationship to the actual application of acrylic. So when we do this work, being that we're sometimes at a hospital, so when we're called to work at a hospital, we do the work. We're not there to take pictures, so they do that for the most part. But even that, they're a little bit shy on that. So. Most of the pictures that we accumulated is from the work that we've done over the years. <clears throat> and it's a little bit difficult when you're doing the work to stop and say, ooh, let me get that shot, that's a good one. So we just take the pictures as we go. So what I did was I kind of had a game plan when I was coming here as far as to show you how we do it and what we do in somewhat of a sequence so you can go out and try doing it yourself if you're not familiar with it. Acrylic, by nature, is a type of product when I first came up with the magic of acrylic saying, well, that's kind of catchy, the magic of acrylic. I like the way that sounds. And then I said, well, maybe that's really over the top, using the word magic. But if you're not familiar with it, it's something that's a little bit cloudy. It's a little bit, mis has a mystery to it as far as the application. But in a technician's hand, it's really a viable tool in as far as doing work that others would walk away from or they don't want to or they'll just tell an owner give it a few months or a month and perhaps it'll grow out or something will help it. So my talk is basically on voids and abnormalities as far as what occurs in the foot during the course of a six week cycle going back and forth to see the horses. So <clears throat> my background prior to this, I had nine years in hospital <clears throat> work in East New York, which is outside of Brooklyn. And what I would do is I took a leave of absence I came back to the hospital, I worked full time, and at the night I would go out and shoe horses, trim, shoeing, whatever it's called. But of course, when you first start out, you get really the worst horses to do, a lot of undesirables. And then after that, I started picking up some of the private accounts. So one of the accounts I worked for was in Brooklyn, and there was about an 80 horse stall facility there. And within that, everybody who was there was either owned a carting company, a construction company, concrete company, and all the fathers were, everybody was almost Italian down that area, so all the fathers would, had all had pinky rings, they all had wads of money wrapped around with a rubber band, and they all smoked cigars, and they all had Cadillacs. So, at any rate, this is my son and myself. This is Jesse, <clears throat> and what we did is, we had one account in New York City also, they had about 50 horses there, so during this time in Manhattan, we had noticed that a lot of the horses would seem to go a lot better for the fact that during the course of the year they would put on an average weekly eight horses we had to put in urethane or synthetic shoes. Right? So we did all the, we did all the gluing on them, we did any, any kind of imaginable rubber shoe, Ulovs, Ibex, Sleipners, Bermuda shoes. We had them on all of them because when they go on the stages, they mar the stages, so they can't have a steel shoe or anything like that, plus it's slippery. So what they had noticed, that all the horses went significantly better with these urethane shoes. However, one of the problems they had, they would have voids in the hoof wall for the fact that the ground is so unforgiving that the feet would break apart. <clears throat> so we would do a lot of acrylic work. And then as we started progressing, Jesse being that he was a graduate from Cornell from the Farias uh, program there on the Mike Wilden side, they have a lot of exposure in regards to acrylic work. That's what Steve Krause has also. So they would do a lot more acrylic work. Jesse did a lot more investigation on it. Then I was in touch with Rick Redden, Steve Grady, Mike Wildenstein, Rudin Riddle, and through Belmont Racetrack, we would incorporate different type of processes as far as application with acrylic, what would be the best way to do it. Okay, the hoof capsule. Every, but this is kind of basic. Everybody pretty much knows as far as how a hoof capsule is designed, what the purpose is, obviously, compression, concussion, energy absorption, dissipation, and blood circulation. However, what we don't think of many times when we're doing this particular type of work, we focus solely on the hoof capsule. That's what our concern is. I'm not concerned about the rest of the horse. What my concern is is this immediate problem that I have as far as this void. So 
we know that impact is the most significant and detrimental aspect as far as a phase, the seven phases in a stride. So with that, knowing that, we understand the fact that impact takes what, one two hundredth of a second to go up the limb. It can go up vertically, it can go horizontally, and it can go horizontally traversely, which means it goes from side to side. So the faster a horse goes, the more that there's going to be more trauma to the foot. The other thing is that 90% of almost all lamenesses, as they say, occur in the front. Even if with that figure, there's even talk and speculation that the majority of the lamenesses occur within the foot itself. So if you have a void or a part of the foot is not functioning properly or if you have a missing section of that, all of these aspects under normal conditions are all compromised. So I had attended a seminar in Florida uh, through a lameness convention there. And there was a French speaker, it wasn't Demois, it was another veterinarian whose name escapes me right now. But he wrote a paper on dissipation of energy through the foot. And it was, for me, it was kind of an aha moment. So I wrote it down so I wouldn't forget it or misplace it. So what he said was, there's a connection between the force of impact and the time during energy is released, right? So prolonging impact time reduces impact force. So in other words, if I prolong the amount of energy that goes into that foot through various means, I decrease the amount of energy as that is expelled. So the energy is displaced. So what we always try to do is we try to, when we replace part of the foot, we're re, really reestablishing the support structure and dissipating the negative energy where that would come into the, the foot itself. So with ducat stat, that's another very important aspect of this, is that if we know that energy is displaced by prolonging the negative effects that go into the hoof wall, and by doing so, it will reduce the amount of force coming into the hoof wall, all aspects that we normally do under ordinary care has to go onto the guidelines as far as trimming is concerned. That is our primary aspect as far as balance is concerned. So with ducats, we have the one-third, let's say, out front, the two-thirds back, but if you look at the one-thirds forward from the apex forward, there's nothing there. There really isn't anything as far as dissipating too much of the energy. However, if you look from the widest part of the foot back, you have all this apparatus, including the digital cushion. Now, what they found with the digital cushion is that horses that are in very soft environments or run on very soft ground, the digital cushion, which is normally very, very porous and has a very extensive lymphatic system to it, will be very soft and mushy and very elastic. So if it's very soft and mushy, obviously the energy which goes into the foot will not dissipate as quickly. So I am not prolonging the shock wave going into the foot. I'm actually increasing by having a very negative, porous type of foot. Whereas horses that are ridden on very firm ground or come from very dry climates, the digital cushion is not nearly as porous. Actually, it's almost like a cartilage or a very hard bristle. So when we have a void in a hoof wall or something is missing in the hoof wall, once again, if the foot is not balanced and everything is forward of the apex, right, energy will not be dispersed, but will be increased. So that is why balance is so crucial and critical in regards to the foot itself. These are hoof implications. This particular one came from Belmont Racetrack. The fellow who initially took care of this horse, this horse had a quarter crack. He really thought he was doing a good thing, and he really did as far as mechanically. He removed the quarter crack on this particular foot. However, he left the whole entire foot vulnerable. He removed almost one-third of that foot. You cannot remove one-third of the foot, especially back from the widest part of the foot back and leave the foot totally naked and bare. So as far as hoof implications, these are the things we normally encounter. They can be a weak hoof wall, fungal infections we get from white line is very common. Environment, we have a very moist climate by us. So unfortunately, once again, for hunter jumpers, polo players, etc., backyard people, due to the high moisture content and soft footing, the, the digital cushion in our area is very elastic, so a lot of lameness can occur just from that. A lot of voids in the hoof will occur from that. Imbalance, that's a very strong factor. So if you refer back to the ducat stud, 
This is why a lot of horses have this imbalance. Injuries. There are injuries. Not that common, but it happens. The hoof wall, as far as doing any resections on a hoof wall, they are. They can be very intimidating. The whole factor in doing a resection is that you have to know the anatomy and the structure of the foot. You have to know the limitations. Where can I go? Where shouldn't I go? What do I have to do? When we do this work, or if you do any acrylic work, you're going to do a resectioning on a foot, always start with the affected foot first. One, you get it out of the way. Two, the acrylic can cure and dry, and then you can move on to the other feet. When we do this work, we always use a Dremel tool. We've tried it with half rounds. We do that sometimes, but usually it's with a Dremel with a half round accompanying that in our knives. When we start with the Dremel tool, all the horses that you'll see here, the pitches, they are without tranquilizers. What we normally do is we start with the Dremel tool, we put it close to the horse, we leave it on the ground, and as we're working, we'll rev the revolutions up higher and higher. The higher the revolutions on a Dremel tool, the easier it is for you to, to know how that works. The acrylic kit. These are all the things you need to know about acrylic. Acrylic is epoxy methyl methacolate. It's an adhesive. So the acrylic has various types of ranges in there. The acrylic, the temperature, ambient temperature is maybe 160 degrees. If you put acrylic straight out of a tube, what I see a lot of people do, it's not going to work. You have to mix it with something. You have to have a substrate. You have to have a, a cloth or a fabric in that. But acrylic normally will take, say, 11 minutes to cure. If you put a fabric on that, let's say polyester, your heat on that will be 115 degrees. The reason why is the bonding agent you put in that, whether it be spectra, uh, polymers of some sort, or a polyester or a polyester vectran, it acts like a radiator. So if you're concerned that you're getting very close to dermal tissue, by putting this against it, it's, it, the temperature will not be nearly as high on that. The other thing you need is hand, eye, ear protection. The hands, you need two pairs of gloves per hand we put on. As you're doing one part, we pull a pair of gloves off, we put another pair. Play-Doh. Play-Doh is like a gap. It, it fills in voids. Impression material, if you're really concerned you're getting very close to the white line on a foot, you mix impression material, we'll put it with a little bit of copper sulfate, we mix it together, we put it in. One of the videos I have, I show you when I'm putting, it looks like bubble gum I'm putting in there, but it's, it's this particular material. Composite material, once again, you don't use acrylic straight out of the tube. What you do is you mix it. You can do shredding when you take fiberglass and you shred it. It's very easy to do. You can do polyester when you butter it. I have a video on that also, a little bit of buttering. Or you can take polyester Vectran, that's stronger. The fiberglass is pretty good for certain types of uh, repairs for say the side walls if they're void or something to that nature. Polyester is stronger because you can use a blanket over that. Also it defers the heat and the polyester Vectran is the strongest that we use and we'll put that at a toe band. The horse will break over at the toe. It protects the toe region on that. Mixing cups, tongue depressors. You mix that. We don't use any like mixing the tubes. We squirt it out of a can. We put it on a pallet. We use like a, if you go to a like a tin like they put like over pies or you go to a Chinese place with those little tins they put, the, that paper with aluminum. We use that, we squirt it on that, we mix it, we just go right to the foot. Wire brush, vet wrap, you always use some kind of vet wrap or something of that nature to cover the uh, coronary band to be assured you don't get it on there. You have to have all your ducks in a row what you're gonna do when you do this type of work. You have to have everything strategically laid out What's the game plan? I evaluated it. Is it a go? Am I going to do this? Am I going to get myself backed up against the wall? You have to be very systematic as far as knowing what you're going to do and how you're going to do it. Once you make a commitment to it, you can't back out of it. So you do it. Don't go crazy with it. Just do it to the point that you know you're going to be safe with it. Dremel tool. As I said, you have to have a Dremel tool. The RPMs, the higher, the better. You don't need a large one and an air dispenser. We just use the air just for the fact of blowing dust off the foot. You have to make sure when you finish uh, debriding the foot that the area is relatively clean, that adhesion will occur as compared to a bad failure. That's pretty much most of it. Most people don't really prep the foot properly, so you're gonna have a failure just based upon the fact that they're not really prepping the foot properly and having all your ducks, as I said, in a row. That last picture right there, not all these horses, if they're really that 
that bad or they look like they're really going to be something that's going to be really an error that I'm going to get a call at night, I don't, I don't do it. I prefer walking away from it as compared to getting a phone call from someone at night. That just really ruins your whole, whole night. And then worrying about if you get a call or something of that nature. So if it's really something really, really borderline that I think it's going to go south, uh, let me just... I have, uh, I'll consult with the veterinarian first. When we do this work, I always ask the owner's permission. I just don't go out there and just do it. I let the owner know that they have a problem with the horse. I give them a ballpark idea how long it's going to take and what it's going to cost them. I just don't abruptly just surprise them with it. If you surprise them with it, they're going to think that you're covering up something or it's an error that you did. And when we get these horses, I don't make them think or lead them anywhere near the towards a direction that we're at guilt or we're at fault for this. This is either a problem that's handed down to us or it's a type of thing that's environment related due to poor care, lack of maintenance, or it's a weakness in the horse, or it's an injury of some nature. But I mean, it's not something that we want to take any blame for. So the next videos I have, this kind of gives you an idea. I'm showing you like, I think it's three or four different types of processes that we do. Each video is like eight minutes, uh, eight seconds rather, sorry. And the first one will show you the problem. The second one shows you kind of like how you repair it. The third one shows you the finished type of thing. What I did when I did this, I took, what you can do too, is I just took a piece of fence. I took a part of a fence because it's got a radius on it. I took my half nippers, half rounds, and I pulled out voids in it. And we just kind of put it together very quickly. So we just took pictures of that. So it just kind of shows you what you can do with it and how you do it. That's rolling it. plastic, you sculpt it with your hands, you form it, you shape it, you puddle it, and that you kind of what it shows you when you can fill that void. It's a little bit light, so you can't really see it, but that's, a, that's almost a half inch depth that I replaced. This is shredding it, take fiberglass, you shred it, then on that pallet you mix it, that's a quarter, it's behind a quarter clip. So I push it into that area, that void, Put it in there. I sculpt it with I'm using a uh, tongue depressor, a little wooden tongue depressor. You just play with it. Put a little bit more in there. Yeah. Shape it with your tongue depressor. Go back and forth. And I use the shrink wrap. Get pretty proficient with this after a while, but always remember to cover your coronary band if you're not really familiar with it. And the top where it seems like that's little gleam, that little shiny thing, that's where you put super glue on that. And you just put super glue across the bead of that, and it just keeps it from water coming into that. I just call this cannoli like a cannoli, if anybody knows what a cannoli is. That's polyester, so I stick it in the polyester. It's like a tube. If you cut the polyester open, it becomes three inch square. When we do this type of work, we always have it so that your if the injury is one third, that's a toe, that's supposed to be a toe piece, this one, on my fence. So I stick the impression material in there if I'm concerned that it's too close. I'll be impregnated with say copper sulfate, mix it together. Now this is a pretty big area. This is like from a toe to a toe quarter on a size one shoe this would be. So this one has polyester Vectran across the toe because the toe, when it makes purchase to ground, break over, you want something strong and durable. You don't want it to be shredding and pulling apart. So that'd be a toe. This is how you sculpt it. 
Once it's hard, you just finish it off like this. You just sculpt it with your rasp. You want it so that it's bulging out a little bit. You don't want it so it's flush to the hoof wall. If you have it flush to the hoof wall, just under the dynamics of the foot, if everything, if the, once the foot makes contact to the ground and the bars drop down and everything moves backwards, if that foot is not balanced in over a period of time, it's going to push it out. It's going to punch it out. So if you make a larger structure as if the foot was there and then bump it out a bit, then you're going to have a better protective base so the normal spreading of the foot won't have a tendency of pushing it out. The other thing, which is a real one, and I've done these errors, I've done all the errors you can imagine, is when you do this, that acrylic will migrate to areas you wouldn't think that it would go to. That's why I'm saying when you do it, make sure you shrink wrap the coronary band. If you do this work and you look at it and say, wow, that looks great, and you have, let's say, shredded material underneath there, and you take up the foot after it dries out, you remove your shrink wrap and you look and you say, oh my God, I actually covered the crease with acrylic and I have a composite material, fiberglass or something in there, a polyester. There's no way you're going to hardly get that out. And now what are you going to do? You have no nails in the foot. Maybe you have one nail on one side or the other side has got three and you have one at the toe and you've got to put two more in the back of this. You can't do it. So what you do is that's when you use the Play-Doh. You do it, you put Play-Doh as a dam. If you don't want it onto the sole of the foot, you pack the Play-Doh the Play underneath where the foot would be so the acrylic doesn't migrate to the sensitive part of the sole. Also, when you do that, when you put that, you put the Play-Doh in the crease of the shoe so you can pull it right out. So this would show you how you do this. So what you do is I got Play-Doh in there, the crease is full, zip, I take it right out, and then there's the Play-Doh right there. Now I can put the nails right in. This is different hoof scenarios, the work we do. The one to the left, the first one, that's a urethane product. Urethane is totally different than acrylic. Acrylic is pretty much as close to the hoof wall as nature will provide. It expands, contracts. Urethane is a little bit brittle. It's pretty hard. You can put it on there, but eventually it'll pull away from the hoof wall. This boss came up from Florida, a very moist, very wet area. This was an 18-hand horse. It's a warm blood. This woman was going to show this to us. She came back. Oh, I came back from Florida. This is the job she gave us. You can't, with the pictures here, you really can't see with the lighting how bad this is. That's a size four foot. The whole wall, we tried putting shoes on it, and it just sprayed the whole thing. So we put the patch on there. That was with polyester, that particular one. This one here is a traveling incident that someone had. This is a relatively, really an easy one to repair. All you do is, normally if we can, we try to put the shoe on first. If we put that shoe on first, it makes it much easier. If you can anchor two nails even in that foot, anywhere, at least you have a surface where you can work with. It's much more time consuming if you don't have a shoe on and you have to build that whole foot up and then try to put a shoe on. It's, it's difficult. It's much easier like this. So this horse kept on rubbing its hind end tied hitting the side of the trail and he wore that whole lateral wall then on the back foot. So what you normally do is you put the shoe as if the foot was there. So that's what we did. Put two nails in, put the shoe as if the foot was there. And my son Jesse there, it's got the acrylic on there, it's got some ram wrap around it. And then he just forms it in there, puddles it in there, you wait for it to cure, you go on to the other remaining three feet. And that's, that's the easiest way to do it. That's what it looks like when it's completed. Once again, it's bumped out, but if you look at the side profile on it, it's as if the foot was there. And it's played on the bottom where you don't want it to go. There's another one, the whole lateral wall. This was a Icelandic horse. Lateral wall was missing when they debrided it. Bend your clip a little bit in as if the clip was actually onto the foot. Clean it, buff it, blow off any debris. Ceram wrapped it, built it, had the shoe, the clip. This one, you really can't see it too much. The center picture there, though, it's got bubbles in it. And the bubbles are air bubbles. When you put the ceram wrap on, you have to push it in. You have to push that material into these voids, and you really have to work your hand and sculpt it around. If you just put the acrylic on there and put wrap on there, the density is not 
close enough to the wall. You have to force it against the, the substrate or the material that you have, and that has to go against the hoof wall itself. You leave it on for, say, 11 minutes. What we do is maybe after the 11 minute or so, we'll put nails into the remaining part of the foot. The reason why we put it in, the nails go pretty easy through the acrylic at that point. We can actually clinch underneath it. You don't you need to bend your clinch nice and slow, bend it in, push it back in. And then the material, the rest of the cure time, will actually shrink a little bit around that nail and it makes it really tight. So then after we do that, once the nails are through, then we take the crazy glue and we'll put the bead across the top, keep water out, and then we put beads of, of the um, super glue on the nail holes also. Or we'll use Rick Redden's wax sometimes, we put it in there also. But it really makes for really a neat, clean job. And once again, the whole thing is, as I said, for a technician, they use it as a tool. For someone who's not familiar with it, it looks kind of mysterious, but it's, it's really not. It's really a very easy, friendly product to use. It really is. The whole thing is just knowing the balance, the symmetry, where to go, where not to go, what's the limitations of the foot. You have to think of the foot differently than what you normally would with the rest of the horse. You have to treat the hoof as a separate entity altogether. And as I said before, the dissipation of shock and the, the energy, the time, as far as the energy going into the foot, that's a real you know, thought-saving process as far as what to do and what not to do with the foot. And we, when you do this acrylic work, you can do it by yourself. I've done many horses by myself, and Jesse's done a lot by himself. Normally we work, since we work as a father-son team, and I'm pretty much like the gopher at this particular point, he's more like the brains of the outfit, so he really does all the work. What I normally do is I debride the foot, I clean it, I organize all the equipment in a, a sequential order. Jesse will do all the rebuilding, he'll shape the shoes, he'll nail them on, and he finishes it. I do like you know, the, the super glue around there, and I prepare the bill to give to the, uh, the owners. This horse was a tough horse to do. This horse had a, uh, a crack, a horizontal crack across the top. I didn't know how he got it. It was never reported to me how he had gotten this crack. But what we did is I knew eventually that was going to migrate down. And that crack went all the way from the first toe quarter nail all the way back to the, the heel, beyond where your fourth nail is. So instead of doing something radically right away, trying to divide that area and build it. We waited till that whole crack just kept on dropping down. So within about two or three months, it dropped down, we removed the lateral wall, and then we debrided the area. But this particular one, we couldn't put a shoe on first. We had to do the bottom, so what we did is we did the roll, like I showed you before. You take the acrylic or the polyester, and you roll it, and that you roll it into like a cigar, and you wet the foot with acrylic first, and then you just place that cigar right there, right? And you shrink wrap it, shape it with your hands, go back and forth with it till you start to feel a cure. And if you want to accelerate the cure, you get yourself a heat gun, or you get a, a, a hair dryer, that'll do it. A hair dryer or a heat gun will accelerate the cure time of acrylic. So, whereas urethane, the highest ambient temperature of urethane is when it first comes out of the tube. The highest ambient temperature of acrylic is over a longer duration of time, so it gives you a little bit more time to work with it. So you can actually futz, puddle, move it. You have about like four minutes, five minutes, and say 75 degree weather to work with acrylic. So, and the whole thing is you have to have pretty good horses to stand. If they don't stand, I mean, we've done it with glue-on shoes, Sigafoo shoes, you got the whole process down, you wrapped it, and then he freaks out, or he pulls it off, or, or someone comes into the barn with a wheelbarrow or something like that. So you, you just, when you work with it, you make your environment pretty clean, and you be assured that you're not going to have as, any problems. This was after seven weeks, just to show you the duration of this, and I said, I, we live in a, a pretty wet climate. This horse stood in mud, and everything, and that foot to the right, that was after the second application. If you look to the first one, you'll notice that the acrylic was maybe about a half an inch from the, the hairline. Let's go back and show you that. 
The one to the top right, unfortunately, didn't get it, but that's maybe a half an inch from the hairline. Oh, there you go, you can see it there. The middle picture, that's when we first did it. The shoe was not on, but you can see by rolling it into a cigar, the foot is flat, right? So the second picture, that's after, say, seven weeks. And you can really see pretty much the disparity on that, on the picture to the left, the lateral and the medial wall looks really the same. It's pretty much equal distribution of weight during that six weeks of time. So, and the picture to the right shows you that how that's growing down. Once again, these are some of the climates. I mean, there's a lot of horses, once we put this acrylic on, that they stand in mud. Urethane being that it's hard and the foot becomes very pumicey, if you put a urethane onto the foot, if, if you want to hold it for two to three weeks, it's going to do it. If you're going to go up to a six-week cycle with this, because this is usually a pretty expensive process for someone to endure, when we do these patches, say a small one is going to run you, say, maybe $120. Say a big one could be like three, maybe $400. Because the material is expensive, your time, you got two guys doing it. So, you know, it is a process. But as I said before, if you do it, the owners, they really think they're impressed with it. This horse, there, this is what happens when you keep a horse an excessive amount of moisture. Both walls, the medial and the lateral side, on one given foot wheel, just like this. And it's not from shallow nailing either, because you can see the nail holes are pretty up high, but it's uniform. They broke off, one broke off next to the other. Boom, 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 boom. This woman wanted to show this horse in what we call the Hampton Classic. I've heard of that. It's really a big horse show out east. You know, McLean Ward goes in there and a lot of big riders. So uh, she wanted to show this horse. We took the Dremel tool. You Dremel each one of those pockets out. You go a little bit above where it is, and, and it's just like treating white line disease. You have to go back to healthy horn. But when we do this, it almost involves all the time the strata medium. So. When we back it up with a Dremel tool, we never go beyond the epidermis. If you start seeing you go into the zone alba, which is a non-pigmented surface of the hoof, we stop. You don't go anymore. And if you nick a foot, do not put acrylic over it. If you see a little bit of hemorrhage, just wait. Just wait a day and say, you know, I, it's very hard for me to detect this, so I'm doing it by hand, and this is what happened. But I mean, otherwise, just go slow, diligently, Know the anatomy of the foot, and you could do it. And that was after we did it. That was when it was debrided, and that's both sides of the foot. And this holds really pretty well. This particular one had shredded material as the first layer closest to the wall, and the second layer was polyester. And the top layer just had a little shine of bare acrylic. If you do shredded material and you put it on and you rasp it, the next time it rasps just like a hoof wall. If you use polyester and you put polyester on and the next time it looks like it's tight because it will be tight and you try to rasp it off, the fibers are gonna come out. So you're gonna see, it's gonna be somewhat in, not a, attractive by appearance because you're gonna see fibers. But they both will hold very, very well. This one we had gotten to. This was a uh, hoof wall distortion on this particular one. You can see it on the front right, the right side of the foot, the non-offended side. You can see it's starting to flare a little bit over there. So this horse had a little bit of a white line, but we didn't realize how extensive it was till we started getting up underneath there. This was really big. This evolved from the toe, middle of the toe, almost back to the heel quarter on this particular foot. And all these horses, believe it or not, they're pretty sound. When we do these horses and we rebuild them, I'm not doing anything really special as far as shoes. Really what I'm doing is if, if you balance that foot back to where it should be, we just put a regular steel shoe on there for the most part. I use steel for the fact that it's rigid, whereas if I use an aluminum shoe, sometimes it's a little bit too flimsy, a little bit too soft, unless it's a therapeutic case. So we'll use a steel shoe and that seems to hold the rigidity to it. This particular one, once we took it back, we realized, oh my God, we, went, we went all the way back to the hill corner. There was no way I could put any nails into this foot. And the veterinarian wanted me to put a shoe on. 
So what we did in this particular case is we debride the whole area, we just put blue coat on top of that, and I put uh, a VETTEC product on the bottom, and we punched three nails all the way in the back. And what I did was we bumped out the back heel area with acrylic, because the heel took such a curve beyond that point, there was no way I could put any nails back there. So by bumping it out, the lateral and the medial, both sides, now have symmetry. So we've gone from an asymmetrical point to a symmetrical point. If we go to a symmetrical point, weight distribution under load will be evenly displaced. So once again, by doing that, I'm prolonging the impact force, right? And I'm reducing the impact force into the foot by creating a more symmetry to it. This is what they call the loop. This is, this is pretty common in business. What you do is with a client, as I said, I don't surprise them. We speak to them prior to doing it. I, I go over everything with them. We fix it, we improve it, right? We sell the improvements to the owner. We assess progress, is it working? I ask the customer, do you approve of it? They give me their feedback, how's the horse going? What improvements have they made? We tell the owners when they do this type of work not to go crazy, be prudent as far as judgment on this. We are affixing a prosthetic to the natural prosthesis of the foot to begin with by having a shoe, and now we have acrylic on there. So they do have to be a little bit prudent in as far as the care is concerned. Uh, bathing is to a minimum an environment, just trying to keep an area clean. And then you go back to it again. Fix it, improve it, sell it, assess it, ask your customers. And that pretty much concludes it. Let me just... There you go. That's it. It's a wrap.